Hello and welcome to your Saturday edition of Collider Mailbag. I'm Perry, this is Dennis, and we're happy to be here this weekend because right off the bat here, I have to let you guys know that there will be no Collider Mailbag next weekend. You probably know why. It's because this wonderful YouTube channel will be flooded with San Diego Comic-Con coverage. I'm super pumped to go. I think you are as well. Yes, I'm going as well. I'm, I'm not going as early as you guys are. So a bunch of our team are going up, what, Wednesday? Yeah, we leave first thing Wednesday morning. Yeah, and I'll, I'll be coming in Thursday night. So I'll be meeting up with you guys a little bit later. Well, some potty time, <laughs> yes. right? All right. And now before we jump into today's questions, I want to remind you guys, if you want your question read right here on the Saturday or Sunday edition of Collider Mailbag, all you got to do, send it via email to mailbag at collider.com. We also have it on Twitter with the hashtag Collider Mailbag. There's a Facebook post and an Instagram post too. Also, this isn't the only place to get your mailbag. We also have a podcast as well. So check out the Collider Mailbag podcast on the Movie Talk feed. Now it's time to dig into the good stuff. Our first question today comes from Aaron Lorenz via email who writes, whom's film would you like to see their final product? Edgar Wright's Ant-Man, Zack Snyder's Justice League, or Lord and Miller's Solo, A Star Wars Story? Thanks. Well, as someone who's kind of fascinated, especially, you know, I'm interested in directing, I would love to actually see all three because mm -hmm. I'd love to compare and contrast what each director did with similar material. Uh, that being said, I think out of the three, I think the Edgar Wright Ant-Man movie would probably be the best one, but I'm more fascinated to see the Lord and Miller solo movie. Not that I, you know, I didn't, you know, like I hated uh, Ron Howard's version. It was just that from, you know, all the reports, it just sounded like they were going in a direction that was much different than what they wanted. We don't know if that was good or bad. Mm -hmm. I do know that I love Lord and Miller's other stuff that they've done in the past. But, you know, the reports of this being too much of a comedy and it being like Ace Ventura or whatever. I just want to see, like, were they on the right path or really was it the right thing to do? Yeah, I'm with you from the standpoint of just being interested in filmmaking and liking to compare and contrast for that reason. But in answering this question, I found myself forced, because I, I wanted to force myself to pick one and just stick with it. And I started to kind of rank how much I liked or disliked these movies. And I liked Peyton Reed's Ant-Man quite a bit. And Edgar Wright since has delivered Baby Driver. So I think I'm pretty satisfied in that department. With Justice League, yeah, here's where you use the the F word. I had enough fun with Justice League, so I was at least satisfied enough in that department. The one that I would say disappointed me most was Solo, A Star Wars Story. And even though I'm not saying, oh, hey, it's Ron Howard's fault that I didn't like that movie or something like that, I would have liked to have seen what they would have done with something where you have guys like Lord and Miller who have delivered some excellent comedy and who have who have a very, I think, bold style. And at least from the reports that we have received, it seems like they were going that route with this solo movie. So I kind of would have liked to have seen what they've done with that more so than what Edgar Wright would have done with Ant-Man or this elusive Zack Snyder cut of Justice League. That yeah, yeah, speaking of the, yeah. the Snyder cut of Justice League, I think fans are kind of convincing or fooling themselves or hyping themselves into thinking that this magical cut will come out and then bam, this movie is going to be a masterpiece. It is not. There's a good portion of, of Zack Snyder's movie already still mm -hmm. in there. Uh, and I, I just don't think, you know, it's if it ever were to come to the light of day that you would watch and go like, oh my God. Yeah. It, it's, it's similar to the way that, uh, at least the way I felt, other people had different opinions about the ultimate cut of uh, Batman v Superman. I watched the Zack Snyder ultimate cut that didn't have anything cut out. So it was like his like vision. And I did think it was better but there were still a lot of issues with it. So it didn't fix all the, the main problems. It, it fixed some of the kind of choppiness of mm -hmm. the original movie and it fleshed out certain things, but it did not save the, didn't make the movie suddenly a masterpiece. Yeah, that's another reason why I think I would pick the uh, the Lord and Miller one, mm -hmm. just because so much of that movie was reshot. Oh yeah, I feel like people I, don't realize like yeah. they spent so much money. That's why it's such like a, you know, 
it was already a disappointment in terms of box office, but because people don't know how much they spent on reshooting that thing, it's yeah. actually even worse. Yeah, I, I would probably bet on it being a lot worse than the headlines uh, we've seen thus far. All right, ready to move on to number two? Yes. Twitter question? We got a Twitter question from Balls in Play, and he writes, or she writes, how do you avoid the con crud? The lines for food can be epically long. What is your favorite snack to pack to get you through the day? I picked this question because this is a very <laughs> important question. I like to be at peak energy level, feeling pretty good from start to finish of Comic-Con. I don't want Saturday to roll, to roll around and to start dragging. And this year, what I'm going to be doing most is hanging out in Hall H, and I'm going to be doing a lot of those panel and footage reaction mm -hmm. videos. So if I am, I, I don't want to say trapped in Hall H, like it's a bad thing. I feel very lucky to be there. But if I am kind of stuck in Hall H mm -hmm. and stuck with that food for, you know, the large majority of the time I'm in San Diego, I'm not eating it. I'm packing bars. I am semi-addicted to Luna bars in particular. So there's going to be a whole lot of s'mores Luna bars and chocolate cupcake Luna bars in my backpack. And... I was just, you know, I was just in New York mm -hmm. and there's a smoothie shop that I'm obsessed with in New York called Liquiteria and they make these amazing granola bars that are, they're just made, so, so it's not like processed mm -hmm. or anything, they're made with their granola and like whole peanuts and some dark chocolate, but it's made with such fresh ingredients. So I might have already bought a whole thing of those, and I might have them packed in Tupperware ready to go. So I am a I am a big uh, a big uh, thumbs up to packing bars and mm -hmm. stuff in your backpack rather than resorting to whatever fast food type options they have in the building. Yeah, in terms of avoiding the con crud, it's very tough. I mean, you're in a place with tens of thousands of people there's so many people around also you know for what we do we're meeting a lot of people we already know people we don't know mm -hmm. you're constantly shaking hands and you know you're you're all around so it's very hard to avoid the con crud uh yeah the lines for food are ridiculously long uh i also pack Bar, I, I like those kind bars. Have you? Kind, ever, bar, kind bars are good, but you know I have a fear of the dentist, okay. and kind bars are a little stickier. Yes. So I'm yes. afraid they're they, they, pull they my are. Out. They're, they're protein bars, but they they actually don't have as much sugar as you think. Yeah. They taste pretty good, but they only have I think. I think it's like five grams of sugar or something like that. It's, it's very a low amount. Admittedly, my Luna bars, I think, have certain ingredients in it that aren't as great as, you know, the 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 100% good for you bars mm -hmm. that are out there. Actually, there's this other bar that I just started eating called RX bars mm -hmm. that are supposed to be, you know, like the purest form of food in a protein bar kind of form. Sadly, I, yeah, I don't. Food wise, I don't take my, care of myself as well when it comes to these con things. And I will drink soda just for the caffeine like mm -hmm. so i'm not a coffee person i do drink tea well coffee you're you're better off at comic-con not drinking coffee because have you seen the line in that starbucks that they dress up beautifully right at the yes. bay front yes it's always so cool and there was a mu uh, movies playing and everything and i want to be in there but i am not waiting in line for an hour for a damn coffee yeah uh so i'll drink soda because I, I try not to drink too much soda on a regular basis just because it's so much sugar, uh, but I, I like the caffeine, so I'll drink, but I will drink soda at cons because I just need that caffeine pick me up. My first order of business after we wrap mailbag actually is to call the hotel we're staying at to make sure there's a mini fridge in the room because in order to avoid the Starbucks line this year, I'm going to go to Ralph's and buy the bottled cold brew and try to yeah. bring it with well, me. Well, hopefully it's a mini fridge that you can actually use well, unlike that's some places that like stack it full of stuff that you can't touch because as, as soon then, as you accidentally touch it, you char you're, you're charged a bunch of money. And then you try to squeeze in yes, one of your things exactly. and you knock it off the sensor. And then before you know it, you got a bill a mile long. I'm not going to do that. Yeah. I'm going to plan in advance and see if they have a mini yeah, fridge. I'm, 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 I'm <laughs> I'm not a fan of the pre-stocked mini fridge. I feel like this is so off topic, but I feel like the more hotels I go to lately, the less have actual mini bars with stuff stocked in it, though. Oh, well, I hope that's a good trend. That's, yeah. that's sorry. 
Well, so so we know Dennis hates having too many streaming services, and he also hates yes. mini bars in hotels. Yeah. Glad we've covered that. Before we move on to question number three today, a Facebook question from Stephen Vo, who writes, what is the worst or most disappointing movie of 2018 so far? So luckily for me, I haven't gotten to watch a lot of the stinkers that other people have. Like people talk about like Gotti, uh, Fifty Shades Free, 1517 to Paris. Death Wish. Those have been on a lot of the people's worst movies of the year so far list. Mm -hmm. I've been, been able to avoid that. So mine is more of the most disappointing as opposed to the worst movie of the yeah. year, which is A Wrinkle in Time. Uh, okay. I'm very disappointed in that just because, you know, what Ava du DuVernay did with um, Selma. Yep. I was excited to see, you know, she sk basically skipped back Black Panther to do this movie. She had a big budget. They, they were hyping this stuff. I've read the source material when I was younger. So I kind of was like, okay. Not that I was like, oh my God, dying to see this movie, but I was very interested be because of Ava. And it just didn't work for me. It, I, I don't think it's a terrible movie, but it's n also not a good movie. It's a very mm -hmm. flat movie. You can see them trying really hard and all the actors and everything. Every, all the components are there. It just doesn't yeah. work together. And so we, it was very disappointing to see that movie. Yeah, I think what kept that one off this list for me was that I think I think the good intentions come mm -hmm. through so strongly mm -hmm. that sometimes that could help weaker elements in a movie. And also, I never really took to that source material mm -hmm. all that much. So it wasn't like I had these high hopes for that part of it. And then it didn't meet my expectations. But yeah, I would have liked to have seen Ava done a little more than what we wound up getting from that movie. You named one of the ones actually you know in answering this question can I, I was can I guess what it is you didn't look at my computer no no no, no, I, no, no. I, I trust I'm just you. guessing you... best based on <laughs> okay. your reaction after you seen the movie yeah uh 1517 you got it I was really <laughs> I was really upset after that movie but actually I'll save my positive note to the end of this comment but 1517 to Paris was was a huge disappointment mm -hmm. it's it's not just that I think it is a bad movie it was so disappointing given the fact that it was based on this incredible true story of heroism. Mm -hmm. And then what you get in this movie, it doesn't take away from the real life act that, that these yes. three individuals did. I'm not saying that, but in the context of the movie, I don't think that the, let's say 90% of the movie that came before that actual thing I don't think that 90% was was teeing up their incredible act as well as it could have. Whereas, you know, when, when it actually came to them, them actually uh, like stepping in and stopping what happened on that train, that part of the movie is exceptionally well done. It's a riveting sequence, but what came before it doesn't serve that as well as it could have. And it doesn't necessarily take away from it in the movie, but it almost like detaches itself from it mm -hmm. where it's like, it, it felt like maybe that could have just been a short and just leave all that other stuff out because, and it wasn't even the performances either. Like no, when I, I, heard, I heard a lot about not so good things about the performance because they're, I mean, they're, they're not real actors. They're not professionally trained actors. They're not great performances mm -hmm. by any means. I, th I think two of the three did have a little bit of uh, charisma that, mm -hmm. that probably could lead to, I, I don't know, if they really wanted to work on it, maybe a better performance in a movie. But the performance wasn't the problem okay. with that movie. It was just about everything else. I, I just, I still, to this day, don't really understand why the story leading up to it was, was structured quite that way, because the movie also introduces their childhood. And I think digging into that a little more and, and focusing on, you know, what was going through their minds and why it let, why their, their childhood and their personal experiences landed them in that position on the train would have been more interesting than, let's say, spending a pretty significant amount of the movie watching them run around Europe taking selfies of themselves. I didn't really want to see that. But anyway, that was that was hands down the most disappointing thing. But the positive note I wanted to end on was in answering this question and scrolling through all the movies that I've seen so far this year. Yeah, not everything was a, a masterpiece, but I think that most things that I've seen this year have been at a certain level mm -hmm. or above where I'm like, OK, it's a, a pretty good year we're having so far. 15 to 17 or 15 17 to, to paris. paris that's one of those movies usually like you know people t are saying the movie's bad that's one usually i'll avoid it this is one i just want to see because i'm interested to see what was actually done in the movie yeah 
I'd be from, cu- from a filmmaking be, from a filmmaking standpoint. I would be curious to know your thoughts. And the only reason why I would actually put you up to this is because the movie's only like ninety minutes long, okay. so it's not like you're watching a two and a half hour movie after, and you'll hate me after yeah, for it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Sorry. you want to go for question four? Yeah, we got a lot of nice short ones today. Uh, Twitter uh, from Twitter, we have uh, Lewis DP seventy nine, and he writes. Why are movie fans so enthralled with death in superhero or action movies, for that matter? In my opinion, that's being a fan of violence when there's other genres like comedy, biopics, animated, and romance. I think there's two ways to look at this. I mean, if you if you look at it that way as being a fan of violence, I mean, may, maybe some people have that mentality about it. But but when I say I am enthralled by death in superhero or action movies, it's more so as it fits into the narrative overall and specifically how how the possibility of death in movies ups the stakes. Yeah. That's that's why that's why I get very engaged in these conversations like who's going to die in Infinity War and stuff like that. I'm, I'm not sitting there rooting for it because strictly because I want to see characters die. It's more so because I want to see how, how the narrative paves the way to it, mm. how it changes the course of just in this specific example, the MCU going forward, and also how it ups the stakes and intensity and suspense of this specific movie or TV show that I'm watching right now. But, you know, you know, as I'm saying all of this, then my mind goes to a certain genre that I love so much. And yeah, in a lot of slasher films, you're kind of sitting there and it's, as, you know, specifically, actually, a franchise that I love so much is Final Destination. Mm-hmm. And really, that movie is all about the most creative death sequence <laughs> they can come. So maybe I fall on both sides of this line, but but even then, it, it's not strictly for, for the joy of watching characters die. It's, you know, in Final Destination, for example, it's, it's about the creativity of it, too, and them using that core concept, that high concept, to further the concept in different ways that we haven't seen before. So, I don't know, maybe I'm trying to, like, steer myself away from that first comment I made, but, you know, as a, as a horror lover and who, someone who can uh, appreciate the escapism of mm-hmm. things like that being able to exist on the big screen and thankfully not necessarily in the real world. I mean, th- there is some fun to be had with that, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I, I echo what you said. It's it's about the stakes. It's not about being enthralled by death. It's like if a characters can't die in specifically superhero movies, action movies, or even, even, even other types of movies, then you're not... If you feel like your character is never in danger, then you're like, okay, you you can still have fun with it, mm. but it still doesn't feel the same. Um, and you know, he mentioned other genres. It's like, sure, that's fine for those genres, like a romance. But you're not sitting there watching, uh, you know, Avengers, going like, oh man, I hope you know, uh, Vision texts uh, a nice romantic thing to Scarlet <laughs> Witch. Ooh, you know, no one's waiting around <laughs> for that. They're waiting to see action. And then within the given context of action, if there's no sense of danger, a sense of, you know, that someone could die or be injured or anything like that that, then really you're just kind of watching people, you know, move around on screen. So. I know you're not as into horror as me, but do you do you tap into, like, the escapism idea of it at all? Like, where, where, where suspense and high stakes like that are a thrill to experience on screen also because it, it's not in play in real life? Sure, sure. But I, I do care more about it in the context of the narrative. And you know, like, I'm not the hugest horror fan, so I don't, wa- I don't like watching movies where it's like, okay, just people are just dying and people yeah, getting yeah, yeah. hacked and slashed or whatever. But, like, for example, one of your favorite movies, Scream, the <laughs> opening sequence is very well done because... First, they they get a name actress in there, yeah. Drew Barrymore, and she, she's all on the posters and everything. So they kind of do the whole Game of Thrones thing, where you're like, okay, and then bam, she's she she dies, yeah, right, and that sets up that feeling throughout the movie, like okay, anybody uh-huh. can be killed, right? And so in that context, that that works from a narrative standpoint because now you're like, it doesn't mean if you know that character you didn't really care, you didn't know much, but you're like, okay, wow, there's tension, anyone could die. So I just feel like that's kind of what what interests me more mm-hmm. than just people dying. Makes sense. Yeah. 
All right, hope we answered your question, Lewis. Now we're moving on to our final question of the day. This is a Twitter question from Loha Debbie, who writes, to have some fun with Matt, with Matt Eisman having guested at the Schmodown desk, which members of Collider crew would do well at America Ninja Warrior, I go with P. Nemiroff. <laughs> I want to do that course so badly. I also would go with Perry. I, the two people I think that would do the best are you and Mark Ellis. It's the CrossFit thing. Yeah, yeah. I think you and Mark Ellis are the most in shape, the most... Right, and also... Body type matters. You can be like super buff. If you watch uh, American Ninja Warrior. It's true. If you are actually like too kind of ripped and you weigh too much, like a lot of the ones like that require you to like go across, let's say beams and carry your whole body weight. Yeah, yeah. I've seen a lot of like buff guys on that just drop because it's too much weight for them and they got to go across or all things. running up the wall. Yeah, just like, so you have to be a certain, you, you want to be athletic and fit, but you also don't want to be like a hulking like, like a bodybuilder would not do well on the American yeah, Ninja yeah. Warrior. You want to have, like, to be fit, but also not s slim isn't the right word, but just like not not Lean. Yeah, yeah. Lean. So yeah. I, I think if I trained, I could do well at it. I, I, I haven't trained in quite a while. I would have I would have faith in you. Okay. I, I would have faith in you. I would definitely if I if I wasn't picking myself strictly because I. I just love obstacle courses. We were actually talking, some of us, about maybe doing a Tough Mudder in November. I don't know if anyone's, whenever I say, oh, do you want to do a race or something, I stick to it, but I don't really trust the group to actually stick to doing a Tough Mudder in November. But I just like obstacle courses. And one of my favorite things about the CrossFit gym that I'm at mm -hmm. is they do a Saturday morning CrossFit class. And normally it's, you know, it's more fun. And mm -hmm. they'll set up obstacles and stuff. And they have a wall and a rope you climb and everything. So I just love like that kind of activity. Mark Ellis is working out so hard that I really do think he'd be pretty damn good at that course. But the other one is Rocco would talk a big game. Oh, and yeah. then, then don't tell him I said this. Someone's going to tell him I said this. He would like lose on the first obstacle or something. <laughs> well, first of all, he goes to my point, even if he works out and he's totally fit, his body type is not made for those type of courses. The, the, I mean, he could probably do You need to okay. hit the perfect middle ground, though, because yeah. it's like you could have so much muscle muscle mass that, yeah. like, you can't you can't bring yourself across that course. But, like, my problem is I have string bean arms, mm -hmm. and I don't have a lot of upper body strength. Mm -hmm. I finally figured out how to get up a, a rope on my mm -hmm. own, like, no knots or anything. But I feel like I would wind up tiring out from mm -hmm. just having to lift my body weight through so many hours. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, I think that's the point of, like, people who are a bigger body type is, and I'm not talking, like, being fat, I'm talking about just if you're carrying so much mass and, you know, that those courses run away, like, I've seen, you know, you've watched it, people are, like, super fit and they yeah, get yeah. tired because it's, it's, it's a lot to do. Do I dare pose this question to the audience? Who from the Collider team do you think would crush the American Ninja Warrior obstacle course? Put that in the comment section. Also, address our headline question, too. What movie this year disappointed you most? Be nice about it, though. People worked hard on those movies, so add some thoughtful insight to why you didn't like that movie in the comments. Dennis, as always, thank you for being here. Another wonderful episode of Collider Mailbag in the books. Thank you guys for watching. Like and share this video. Tell everybody at the podcast, and we will see you tomorrow morning with another episode of Mailbag. Hey, everybody. Mark Ellis here. Thanks for watching this episode. You want to watch more? Then click up here. Or you can click right here for more great content from Collider. If you haven't subscribed to Collider Video, do so right now and share this vid with your friends. Thanks for watching.